Thank you. Oh, welcome, Dorothy. Thank you. Thank you for coming in and making the time. Um, you have got 10 minutes for your submission. If you'd like to leave some time at the end for questions, um, okay. that would be up to you. But I'll ring the bell um, when there's one minute to go and then two bells to signal the end of time. Cool. Thank you. Um, thank you for seeing me today. Um, when the submission came up, I was, I was really pleased to see it come up and that, that it's um, in the um, to be reviewed. The biggest thing out in the rural sector is actually catching the buses into town. And as like question 15 here, I think I've got it in the right way. No, one. Um, I do agree with, well, the proposed ridership and coverage aspirations in different parts of our region. I'll put no there. Um, not really understanding the question, so I, I wasn't sure. Um, what would I want changed and why? In, in the whole process that I read, the, there wasn't enough consideration to do with the time frames. Um, as I take it, you can read what's in front of me. Um, I used to catch the bus into Hamilton quite regularly. Um, I stopped doing that because an hour and a quarter at that time was just too long. Then the expressway opened, so now it's like 15 minutes to the base and 25 minutes to the middle of town. So my question there is basically the review is really good, but the time frames aren't there. So to get people back on buses, we really do need to look at the time frames that, that that's in place at the moment. Um, and, and like going forward, um, is there's so much development going on. I'm not sure if you're aware of the development in Taupri, but there's some in Narawahia and there's also the Lake Tiara districts um, and there's also a big one gone up in Horatu. So consequently, that's also going to impact on the bus service and it's going to take longer again. So please consider the timeframes when you, you actually um, do the bus routes. Um, what we would need more information about is another transport hub and to support Hamilton on and off the expressway, all locations could use the expressway, Auckland, Hamilton, Tauranga, and what you refer to as the Golden Triangle. Um, it's very quick and on and off. Um, and the, yes, the carbon is, is a very good one as well. Um, yes, I do support this concept of the council potentially offsetting unavoidable emissions. Um, if the council was to implement offsetting initiative, would you expect what would I expect? In theory, it sounds great, but this will come at a cost. And at the moment, with the the rising of everything coming into play and rates also going up, I just it, it's it's really coming like hard for everyone to not only pay their rates, and there's going to be an increase in our rates, the cost of living as well. So just bear in point of, of that and the environmental side of things. The rail car, yes, that, that is really cool. Um, and the improvements, cost effective, so long as they're cost effective, it would be good. Again, time frames here is, is really important. And, and I think we've got a rail system. I just did the rail system um, for the, celebrating the 50 year um, down in Palmerston North to Ra Rimu. 800 people was on that train. It was huge. So I think people don't mind using that rail system, but the time frames aren't there. Um, it was a really good trip. Um, what opportunities are you aware for the regional council to partner with the transport provider or organisation to answer wellbeing? Currently, Tauri Community Board has put in a proposal draft regarding a transport hub to support Hamilton and the Waikato district. A park and ride in Tauri, just off the expressway, this would have great accessibility and parking. The aspiration for Tauri people that this could become the transport hub for the Golden Triangle, that not only the Waikato district, Tauranga, and support Hamilton Central. Now, Hamilton Central is, is, is getting a really busy place. It, it is really huge, and to get on and off, it's, it's like... And it's also developing out there. Um, and also to have it a, a, like an express service for, for workers in that peak time is, is um, would be, you know, from Huntley and people from Huntley 
um, they could start from Huntley, come to Tautpree, and then enter the expressway from the hub in Tautpree. And then the next stop, the Narrawahi people could actually catch it at Horatu, outside the BP, which is where the Tiara Lakes are going in. Um, it is an essential service, access to a bus or train service with workable timeframes. Um, essential service for a disability, mum and pushchairs, prams, cyclists, and a place to put luggage. Recently, I was in Wellington and I was impressed with their buses down there. That um, I don't know how it would work. Um, it's probably something in your court more than mine in the fact that just inside the door, there was a place to put um, small bags or small uh, pushchairs or just, it wasn't much, but it was just inside the door. Also, collapsible seats where a pushchair could be put with a mum. Um, cyclists, I'm not sure, but I have seen them being on buses. Um, I don't know of anyone that essentials that would struggle, um, apart from what I've just commented on. Um, access for difficult and disabled people, consideration of mothers, families, and pushchairs and bags for children is probably the biggest one there, um, which is why they don't use the buses. Can we access all these services? We can. Um, with the new subdivisions going in Tautpree, I don't know what the Regional Council's plans are for extending to go round Tautpree or just have it on the main road like it is at the moment. I don't know. Um, that's obviously in your court. It's just a question I thought I'd throw in there. Um, and also with, with doing and extending like you do at the base at the moment, it puts another time, unfortunately, on the bus service. So basically, I suppose the express bus I'm talking about is between the peak times, not nine to three, just the peak times. Um, how far would I reach to travel this in the location? A bus route is, it should be about 500 yards or so, intercity service, seven k's, depending on the dates or leaving or pick up times in Hamilton. Um, it's it's a real, it's really the time frames from Tautpree, it's just too long. Um, do I currently drive a car? Yes, I do, and I use it more probably that because of the times. Um, I do agree with yeah, a network of fast, reliable public service. It would be a really good achievement for all concerned to actually do this. Uh, more and more people, and especially from the urban area um, and the country, are coming into town more and more. Um, yeah, as the report says, at all locations would be accessible in affordable rates and fares and timetables, assuming it was user-friendly, being reliable and fast. Uh, yeah, I did do the trips as you as you know, um, as I just mentioned. Um, but it comes back to fares, accessibility, and public transport. And once again, it's, it's probably the emphasis I've put on here is timetable and also um, the size of the buses. I, I, you asked here about going to electric. It would be really good in off-peak times to cut down the size of the buses. Like when we're in town, the orbit often, especially in Flagstaff. Road attorney area is always half empty. So whether you want the half empty or half full glass, it's, <laughs> it's, it's your call. Um, just to cut down costs, I don't know what the cost would be to, to have a smaller bus or a bigger bus, I don't know. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, um, Dorothy, for making the time to come in and talk to us. Um, I've got a question from you, Jane. Yep, yep. thanks, Dorothy, um, <coughs> for coming in and presenting. Um, you did raise some good points. Um, through the work that you've been doing at the, with the community board, um, and you have mentioned it, it is it is sort of a common theme of the time it takes to get from Huntley and Kopiti areas into into the city for work. So right. um, I support um, where you're going with um, having express buses, and I'm sure that with through Gareth and um, Vishal, there's probably been a bit of discussion with Andrew around that and how how we do that. And using using the expressway, so it becomes more similar to a car transport. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is just, um, I know you've been working with Vishal around um, possible um, land acquisition and and Telpri for park and ride, which um, first of all commend you for coming up and, and pushing pushing us, and um, and also um, Vishal and that around 
uh, seriously looking at that, and I'm sure he'll be then filtering that in through the, um, the this committee and and with Andrew and the likes. And yes, so um, yeah, you put a lot of thought into this. So thank you. That's good. Yeah, thank you for your question. Um, I just had a question. Um, you mentioned about uh, rail improvements and coming back to a suitable timetable. Could you just expand on what a suitable timetable would look like to you? Well, at the moment, Te Huia train travels from Rotokaui and it's only for, like, what is it, two hours in the morning? Um, and it leaves quite early and there's two, two times and it's also at night. Now, there's a lot of people I know in Huntley and Narawahi and Taupri. We get in our cars and we go to Papakura and we stop at Papakura and we leave our cars there and we go into central Auckland. Um, I don't know how that would work to do a better timetable there, but, um, yeah, that's a, I would like to see it more through the day. Um, I know there's a lot of uh, – Huntley's not that far away from most of us. So we could catch rail from there to go to Auckland. Um, you know, there's not a lot of people go there, I'm sure, but it's nice to have the opportunity to be able to go in a certain time frame to even go to a show, um, to an event, um, just to do shopping or catch up with friends, because I think most of us these days have got family or friends all over the New Zealand. COVID has hit us pretty hard with that, but just to, um, a lot of us aren't confident driving in Auckland, so to actually get a train into the middle of Auckland without stopping on the motorway is absolutely amazing. Yeah, just um, one couple of th further questions. Um, so you're talking weekday or weekends? Well, that's uh, probably time frames come into that. So you'd have probably for me, um, a little bit of research would have to go into that to see how it would go. Um, and whether you, uh, it's arranged around events. Um, just just the netball just recently and um, there's concerts coming up and also the All Blacks are playing. So all that, you know, if it comes back to on and off a train would be so much easier than, or even a bus would be so much easier. You know, but weekends or weekdays, um, yeah, most, a lot of people are working, of course, but there's a lot of us that aren't as well. And last question, um, what would be your ideal time frame to spend in Auckland once you're up there? Well, if I'm up there and I go and leave about 10 and catch the Papakura bus, the last time I did that, um, we didn't come home till 4. Okay. So once we get off at Papakura, we kind of, it's an easy drive home on the expressway. Yeah, yeah. so it's, it's a good day and we catch up with people and make a day of it. Yeah. Mm. But the rail goes right through the country, and after seeing the interest when I was down in Palmerston North on that big rail train, 800 people is a lot of people. Yeah, it, was, it worked really well. Mm. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, and, yeah, keep up the good work that you're doing up in Tōpiri. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for coming in. Okay, thank you for having me. Turn this off. Fine. <laughs> Um, John, John Lawson, are you online? Yeah, yes. Oh, there you are. Um, we have got a little bit of a space. If you'd like to move your submission up, we could hear yours now. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Fantastic. Um, I believe you have five minutes. So I'll, um, if you'd like to leave time for questions at the end, that would be fantastic. Kia ora. Um, yeah, so far there's been uh, a few mentions of needing more buses and trains and so on, and the plan calls itself ambitious. Um, but I don't know if you noticed, but yesterday Auckland Transport um, produced a transport emissions reduction plan, 
and they're looking to reduce their emissions by 64 percent by 2030 um, which is an awful lot more ambitious than this plan which doesn't actually say how much the reduction is going to be um, as far as I can see, this plan doesn't even mention climate except reducing bus emissions, and it, it's great that it does. Um, but I also wonder whether um, it, it's looking sufficiently at um, what, what is going to be needed in the way of uh, reducing emissions. Um, the uh, slide that you've got in front of you shows that um, pathway four, which is one that they Department of Transport added on when it saw the um, emissions required from transport in the uh, climate change plans uh, from the Commission um, <clears throat> was looking at, um, as I've circled by 2035, a 39% reduction in transport emissions or, or, or in light vehicle um, travel rather. And um, to achieve that, um, some of it can be done by getting people to be online as I am at the moment, or by people cycling or walking. Um, but an awful lot of it's going to have to be by uh, people using public transport. And again, yesterday's plan from the Auckland uh, transport was looking at increasing the uh, tr transport use from the current 4% of journeys to 29% by 2030. And uh, uh, think it would be good to get Waikato doing the same um, <clears throat> and even 29% is quite modest by international standards. Um, look for example at Baal in Switzerland, a very similar sized town to Hamilton and their um, commuter use is 47.2% or was in 2019 <clears throat> and so it, it is very achievable. Um, but it's achievable by them having buses running every 10 minutes or so and by having trains and trams and all sorts of things which um, aren't even being envisaged at the moment. Um, so basically I want to ask you to look at being a lot more um, optimistic in the way of the way that things might be done. Um, also to look maybe at um, my second slide uh, which was showing how things were a century ago and how you're planning to have them 100 years on. Um, and if anything, it's gone backwards. Um, so it seems to me that, again, you need to be looking at the coverage, at the frequency and at what's being spent. You, um, to, it wasn't um, from ratepayers' money, but it was from government money that what is it, 850 million plus has just been spent on the Hamilton bypass we've been hearing about. Um, and yet that money doesn't seem to be available for public transport. <clears throat> and give, given the urgency and given that um, areas like Auckland are now looking at making those changes, it seems to me that Waikato could well come in line with that. So I think in my five minutes, probably that's all I've got time to say as a summary, but I'm quite happy to answer questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, John, for your um, presentation and your slides as well. Um, you mentioned in your written submission about the Raglan bus um, and a proposed Greenslade Wharf Whale Bay bus. Could you just expand a little bit on that one, please? Uh, well, there, there has been a proposal. Um, well, in fact, um, in the Waikato long, long term plan, um, there's 100,000 a year set aside. Um, for several buses around the <coughs> district, um, one of them being an internal Raglan bus. And the current thinking on that is that it would run from one side of Raglan to the other, from Greenslade Road via the wharf, which has parking problems, via the CBD, which has parking problems, um, via the uh, coastal reserves, which have got parking problems out to Whale Bay, which has parking problems. So basically, it's a way of sorting out parking problems. But at the moment, it's only being looked at for an hourly service with a 12 seater bus, um, which isn't going to solve all that many parking problems. So the potential is there. And as I say, to get um, people using things reliably, you need a much more frequent service. I remember when I first travelled on the Auckland trains in 1995 and they were virtually empty. 
but they only ran every hour um, and now they run every 10 minutes or so and um, up until COVID the problem was they were overcrowded so running services more frequently people start using them whereas infrequent services and they don't so that's one of the problems. Thank you for your answer. Um, I believe we have a question from you, Jane. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, John. Um, the two things. So the uh, internal bus service, um, the Greenslade, um, Well Bay um, circuit, etc. Yes, that has a. Um, it is. It is a trial, and we do hope to get that started in October. Um, that money was some some budget that was unspent. And it didn't have attached any waka kotahi funding with that and so we had to um, try to spread that over the district and look where we thought we could get best bang for buck um, under a trial system so um, it is it is happening and hopefully it does kick off in october we want to get it underway before summer um, it is there and i know there's a lot of work doing on it if the 12 seater bus does not become efficient enough um, capacity wise there is um, scope to be able to um, increase that size so as it is a trial we did not want to throw all the eggs into one basket because there's many other areas of the district that are demanding extra services as well so we try to create a good even spread with that and just the quick the last question to you so you're talking about the two hourly run from Hamilton and uh, out to Raglan would you like to see that sort of frequency increase during the peak times or is that all day service? Uh, as I say, people use the service if it's frequent and, and you keep seeing it. I gave the example of Auckland, but um, you might remember way back that Union Steamship gave up the service um, from Picton to Wellington saying nobody wanted to use it. Um, and it was taken on by the railways and they increased the number of ships that were running and suddenly that became the way that people travelled. Um, and you can see examples all over the world, all over the country of the way that increasing services actually attracts people to them. Um, and very often that increase hasn't been ex expected by the planners. So, yeah, it's great that, um, in fact, I was very surprised and pleased that Waikato District Council did take that initiative on the buses, not just in Raglan, but around the district. So well done. Um, but it's still just going to be um, the tip of the iceberg if we're going to look for the sort of percentage increases that were in my first slide, um, which as I say, Auckland announced yesterday that it is now looking at. Um, so that sets something of a precedent, this 39% decrease in uh, car travel. Yep. Thank you. Well, thank you, John, for um, making the time to submit. Um, yeah, really appreciate it. Um, yeah, thank, thank you. you. All right, um, our next submitter is due at 11.10. Um, the 11 a.m. is uh, hasn't shown up yet. So we've got a teeny tiny break.
can just talk into the mic. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Welcome, Roger. Morning. Hi. I'm hard of hearing, so okay. I need to read lips. That's fine. Welcome and thank you for coming in. Um, thank you. We appreciate it. you coming in. You you have got 10 minutes. Okay. If you'd like to leave questions, time for questions at the end, mm -hmm. um, that'd be great. Yep. So, yeah, okay. You. Since I've re sent in my report, I've had um, more statistics come in about um, Service dogs have been refused entry on public transports, buses, um, and taxis. It's done to get quite high within New Zealand. It is a major concern for us. There is eight disability organisations out there within New Zealand under the Government Dog Control Act 1996. This is a privilege to have a service dog. It's not a right. So we've got to pay by the laws of what the government set outside for us. So we're allowed to go into shops, hospitals, council buildings, etc. The safety for service dogs is very high, more than so than pet dogs, family dogs, as you like to call it. Auckland buses in a refused a service dog after a pet dog was on there first and rushed out a service dog. The service dog was re refused entry onto the bus and left on the side of the road. That is sad to see within New Zealand. There are a total of 25 service dogs have been refused in the public transports in New Zealand, four in Wellington, eight by taxis, that equals 12. Three in Hamilton, one by taxis equals four. Two in Auckland and one by taxi equals three, one in Dunedin and two taxis in Taupo, Tauranga, two in, on the buses and one by taxis in Napier. This is a major concern for our service dogs within New Zealand. The drivers are meant to stop, I understand, by the legislation but that um, with service dogs, because blind people can't see them coming and they're at this bus stops, they should be able to be picked up, but the bus drivers keep on driving past. Within the North Island, there are three times in a week, despite being, being contacted by the land transport authorities and having us to be picked up, we've been refused. <coughs> it's bad enough within Hamilton the bus driver closes the doors and won't allow us on. That is a concern in itself within New Zealand. There are a few places where our service dog has shown a story. You would have that in front of you. It's sad to see where the bus driver doesn't care and unfortunately the dog handled her and the dog got stuck under the seat. This is so stressful for them both to get on and off the bus. The major concern one we're having and facing in within New Zealand are these very fake service dogs labels being put on pet dogs. This is also a concern with civil defence that I'm involved in as a spokesperson for, for the hearing dogs for New Zealand. So this makes my job a lot harder within civil defence site, but it's also the council and government's problem to keep these service dogs out of our district in New Zealand as well. There are a little bit of homework there for you to have a look at uh, that I've attached to the papers that you can go on and see them in the, in the newspapers and also on, a lot of it's online about how many service dogs has been refused. The latest one was on the urban um, transport where the driver got abusive towards a person having a service dog. That is so sad to see within New Zealand. That's my speech. Thank you very much for your time, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Roger. Um, we've got a question from Councillor O'Leary. 
Hi, Roger. It's really nice to see you. Thank you for submitting and thank you for all of the stories. Uh, it's very unpleasant reading. Um, Roger, one of the questions in your submission, uh, you, you're, I think you're asking, is there a charge for an assist dog to go on to PT? I'm not aware that there is, but have you or yes. in, have you experienced? Yes, I've experienced that charged? myself. Um, $25 to have my service dog to go on the public transport. And I had to pay by cash. And can Roger, can you tell me what um, what area you were in when that happened? It was in Hamilton here. Do you remember how long ago? It was in 2016. And Roger, did you make a complaint about it? Yes, that? I did. You did? And what was the response? Um, I went in to saw the manager at the um, transport, transport centre? department yeah. centre here. Yeah. And they turned and said, oh, well, that's what it is. And they didn't want to take it any further, so I ended up contacting regional council, yeah. and I put a written complaint in. Okay. And also, I, it also happened to with me in 2020. Oh, but that was my next follow-up question. Has it happened since? Okay, thanks, Roger. Second question. I'm just not quite clear on one of the pages where you talk about priority seating areas um, in the front of buses. I'm aware that there is space for wheelchair users. Yes. But um, what, in your view, what would a safe space for an assist dog look like? Because I'm assuming that's what you're requesting of us. Well, a lot of service dogs um, under the New Zealand law and the police, if a dog's not st strained and put into a proper seat, they are a, a jet dog and with half his weight, he's weighs 13.5 um, kg. You times that by four yeah. in an accident, that is someone to get killed with if it hits the head. So a um, mm. container here, that is 1,500 kgs flying into someone's head in an accident. So, and that so, came from New Zealand police. Okay. So, Roger, are you aware around the world where on a, a bus or public transport, whether it's train, etc., what a... A, a dog seat might look like? It's a normal seat. It's just a normal seat where they can turn in. Um, if some bus has got safety belts on, um, it, we can turn and use the harness or the clip lead to, it. to yeah, clip around to, to it to <laughs> make it sure it's secure. So we're taking up an extra seat. Yeah. Um, and a lot of us with our small dogs, we can turn and put it in between our legs and we used our own safety belts, what we use, yeah. and clip into it because okay. um, the lead's long enough. It's just uh, so it doesn't come as a ejectile when it comes into yeah. an accident. Yeah. There are some buses uh, slamming on brakes to hurt service dogs, and that's in um, Napier. In, uh, no, sorry, Wellington. Or, that's as it has happened. So that went really... Um, to the to the police and also to the NZTA, what I understand. Okay, really appreciate your comments. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, thank you, Roger, for coming in. Um, yeah, some food for thought for us to look at our um, service dog policy and mm -hmm. how we can um, yeah help you to have a more pleasant experience. Yeah. What I find is that out of the statistics um, between male and female. Is the male is the one has been refused entry more than the female, so it comes down to demonstration of sexism, um, and that is sad to see within our New Zealand. So, we, what my education is is let's educate the staff <coughs> and the bus drivers, give them the, all the full facts of the eight service organisation. I do a presentation about the eight services of disabilities within workplaces, schools, and um, and some of the councils, and also our civil defence team. So I work closely with um, Mr. Young um, within the civil defence. So yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Um, we've got another question from you, Jane. Yeah. So, uh, hey, thanks for your presentation, Roger. Um, it's not so much a question to Roger; it's just more of a comment. Um, as Councillor O'Leary said, a um, bit sad reading this um, because, in my mind, that this should never happen. Um, 
you know, I was over living overseas 30 years ago and um, service dogs and that were just part of transport life way back then. So as a country, we're obviously way behind the eight ball with this. And uh, just to, to, to us here in, in this hearings <coughs> panel and, and to staff is something we should look at that this sort of stuff doesn't happen again. So we should really address that. So. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Yeah. Thank you for coming in. Yeah. You're welcome. Good to see you. Thank you. So this is Harper. He's six years old. So he alerts me to the doors, smoke alarms, cook timers. Um, they're also trained for ma baby monitors and um, phone uh, computer tax machines. $30,000 to train. We don't get no government funding. So, um, yeah, so we do a lot of presentations. So if you want me to come and do a proper presentation later on, let me know and I can come over. Make sure there's a good cup of coffee and a green cake on the side. <laughs> Thank you for the offer. Yeah, appreciate it. Nice to meet Harper too. Hi. Hi. Right. Welcome to our next submitters, uh, Ray Chen and Steph Eiermunger. Yep. Welcome. Thank you for making the time to come in today. It's a real pleasure. Um, you have got a one, two, four, one, um, 10 minutes. Um, and if you'd like to leave some time for questions at the end, that'd be fantastic. Thank Brilliant. you. Well, kia ora tato everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, ko rei chen, uh, toku inua. I'm the Director of Engagement at the May Group, and today I'm accompanied here by my colleague Steph Ayamanga, who's Engagement Manager for the Eden Orotokori project uh, that we're embarking on. So it's a real privilege to be back in the building, reconnecting with our regional uh, and our local leaders as well. A little bit about the MAID journey. We started uh, our journey seven years ago with a vision to really design and deliver human-centric large-scale communica uh, communities that really focus on creating places and relationships that engender belonging. Uh, as you may know, it was founded by Charles uh, and uh, MAID is committed to a long-term holistic approach to community building and leading the way in conjunction with our local, national and international partners to seed the foundations for what it might look like for better community building here in Aotearoa. So instead of building just the hardware uh, and saying good luck, goodbye, uh, we'd love to ask the question, what's possible if developers like us assumed uh, the role more of a community builder and actually stayed for the long term to empower the early implementation of the social outcomes that we all want to see that make a community amazing. Things you can't touch, like the software of the place, health, well, health and well-being, employment, waste and sustainability, uh, strong community spirit, and of course, integrated transport. So our unique community building journey began with our flagship project in Oranga, that is located uh, in the exciting new regeneration of Drury up in Auckland. Uh, Oranga's master plan community came to life as a result of a human-centric approach to urban design in partnership with some global thinkers in the field of integrated and interconnected living. So in other words, uh, international urban design leaders uh, who were really interested in scientifically understanding how humans behave and move as a community beyond the use of a car, and designing a built outcome that actually promotes walking, micromobility, human interaction, and connectivity to your neighbors, uh, and of course, connectivity, most importantly, to public transport as a priority. So a little bit just about Oranga before we move on to Eden Orokori. We are currently zoned for 3,500 homes with a strong emphasis on civic amenities that bring people together, uh, including a really beloved village square, five kilometers of a coastal walkway, so do take your dogs up it whenever you're up there. Uh, Mana Whenua collaboration to regenerate and give public access to our eco islands, pre, primary and secondary schooling, full retirement village, sports park and the creation of a retail employment and health focused town centre, all interconnected by an integrated transport strategy. We have also begun now up in uh, Drury, uh, an integrated transport system approach, working with national and international partners to uh, offer residents several modes of micromobility that includes walking, e-scootering, biking, e-car sharing, and shuttle systems that integrate seamlessly with public transport. As you can imagine, that is no mean feat, and uh, we can't do it uh, by ourselves. So our partnerships currently include Beam, Big Street Bikers, Mercury Energy, 
Easy Mail Autonomous Technology, Auckland Council, and of course, Auckland Transport, who actually helped facilitate a bus service located in the village heart of the community and within the six, uh, first six months of residents moving in. And that particular bus service has seen an uptake uh, from what was less than three uptakes a month to now exponentially 175 uptakes per month for a community of only 200 residents. So just a little bit perhaps about Eden Rodakari and uh, Steph, you can take over this part. Maid is thrilled to be igniting the next chapter of community uh, building vision with Eden Rodakari, underpinned with the same founding vision, values and pillars for a better community. Located in Rotokauri and enclosed by State Highway 1, State Highway 39 and Burbush Road, the development has a total land mass area of approximately 137 hectares, including a preservation of two hectares of native ecoforest. The development has capacity to accommodate up to 2,000 homes and a similar, similar civic amenities approach to Oranga. It's strategically located near Rotokauri train station, um, which is approximately two kilometres to the east of uh, the east near the base. Stage one includes approximately 200 homes and site works commence early next year. And the first homes are expected to be occupied in early 2024. One of our learnings from Oranga is that an integrated transport strategy approach will be a key to a better community at Eden Rotokauri. We are proactively forming relationships with key stakeholders, including Hamilton City Council, Waikato Regional Council and Go Eco, to learn and understand to, live, to deliver better outcomes for the local community. In that spirit of local learnings and partnership, we're excited and support the general philosophy and direction of, regional, of the Regional Public Transport Plan. Eden Rotokauri has already begun its design and delivery process to enable the delivery of low emissions integrated transport system, supporting the interconnectivity between micromobility and public transport. And so there are three key points of support that we wanted to just relay today in regards to the regional uh, public transport plan. Firstly, we really support the fact that we want to provide alternative modes to car usage that enables early behavioural change. We acknowledge that there is a challenge of ensuring early public transport options are available, but emphasise that that is better than a later stage retrofit both in habit and in hardware. We, along with our national partnerships, are also committed to making sure that we stay for the long run to enable micromobility habits and uptake. But without the early implementation of public transport for in and outbound mobility, we will not have a strong chance to enable this environmental and well-being aspiration. Secondly, we also strongly support the ridership focus for the plan being based on the grid pattern. What is missing is the importance of strong linkages from the bus to the rail at this point, especially given Eden Nordicaldi's proximity to the base, employment opportunities, and also, of course, the rail network. And thirdly and finally, we absolutely support uh, the work towards implementing a rapid rail system between Hamilton and Tamaki Makoto, connecting two large city communities that have been growing closer together since the inception of both cities. This rail network would connect the two very fast growing business zones of South Auckland and Hamilton North and provide a significant strategic nexus between both airports uh, and the regions as well. It will also enhance and lead residential and business growth between the cities enabling residents uh, in the two city communities to realistically actually commute to work uh, in each city uh, for a daily basis. So going forward, we are really looking forward to continuing our workshopping, our conversations, our discussions, and of course our learnings with Waikato Regional Council, Hamilton City Council, and all the other stakeholders who really aspire to implement a better way of sustainable, accessible mobility uh, for the Waikato region. So with your continued support and also active collaboration, uh, Eden Rotokauri is active and we're very ready to explore all possibilities of an early and comprehensive approach to integrated transport that realizes the vision of the regional public transport plan to its fullest potential. So we thank you again for allowing us to appear here today. And um, if we have any time, uh, more than happy to take questions. Thank you, Ray and Steph, for your um, submission. Yeah. Um, in your written submission, you mentioned a unified transport app. Could you just tell us a bit more about that? 
Yeah, this is just a very beginning exploration uh, in Auckland where we understand that the software of integration is important as the hardware of integration. And that was very much raised by Auckland Transport. Uh, and early approaches uh, actually was very much based on learnings from the AT app, uh, where they're trying to actually combine several modes of understanding how you can book your scooters, uh, actually find out your bus time and your train schedules, and eventually moving towards even payment for those under one roof. Uh, and we continue to think that that is a really great idea. In fact, in Oranga's Village Square, where the integration hub is, we're saying that that would be a brilliant example for all the modes to meet together and try to make that app uh, get to its next level. Thank you for that explanation. Um, any other questions? Thank you for your time to come in today. Yeah, very interesting um, proposal. We look forward to seeing the good things that you're doing out there. Good day, Ryan. Thank you for your time. Thank you. All right. Welcome, uh, Dr. Anna and Dr. Ooh, Elisa Pisi. Thank you. Um, you also have ten minutes to present. Um, if you'd like to save some time at the end for questions. That'd be cool. fantastic. Thank you. Um, oh, what page? Um, one, two, oh. seven. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, nā mahi tuatahi ki te atua nui i nā wā katoa. Nā mahi ki te rangatira o tēnei rohi ki ngi tu heitia. Uh, nā, nā mahi ki te mana whinua o Tainui Waka. Uh, nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, Ko Anna Aho, I'm the um, chair of the ACRE committee, the Advisory Committee Regional Environment, which is a committee that's been um, around since 1989. So I just thought I'd drop that in there because I think that's quite an impressive <laughs> um, length of time for a committee, uh, advisory committee to regional um, environment and including regional council um, to uh, exist and still be advocating on behalf of the environment. So. Um, it's an, a pleasure to be here today. So, as I said, my name's Anna, and let you introduce yourself. Malo elele, kole peke ho fanga fuga tapu ka tamo ki fenga Maria ko eni ke ukau nga kau pe mo tokta Anna ihe mo minute fuga 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 eni. My name is Elisa Pesi Javier, and I am the newest member of the ACA as I just um, recently joined. Um, this committee um, in April this year. I'm currently a um, lecturer at the Waikato Institute of Technology, and I'm currently um, doing some research around um, climate change education in the Pacific and also um, here in New Zealand. Malo Pito. So, um, Elisa Pisi will just uh, read a little bit about our, our submission, and then I'll just follow up with what's been circulated to you um, today, which um, may take a little bit of getting your heads around because I had to read it a few times too. So um, it's a shame Martin, who's, who's on our committee, isn't also here because he's actually the one that, I, you know, came up with this uh, part of our submission. Um, but I will do my best to explain our concerns in, in, that, in that space. But So ECA is a Waikato Regional Council Advisory Committee whose purpose is to act as an environmental advocate by promoting the protection, preservation, conservation and enhancement of the natural values and character of the Waikato region. We connect the dots between policy and practice. ECA supports the proposed draft regional public transportation plan. We appreciate that the plan offers more of the residents in the Waikato region a viable alternative to the use of a private vehicle for transport. ACA generally supports the objectives outlined in the plan and in particular comments the council's aspirations to reduce carbon emissions. It is vital, it is vital that we act with urgency because climate change is an emergency. We appreciate the vision of enhancing quality of life by enabling access to opportunities. 
you will see in our submission that we ask you to develop an objective around public transport equity, including measuring and reporting on who does not travel as much as others and whose trips are unsafe or uncomfortable so that investment can go into, into improving those people's choices and experiences. This was a recommendation that stemmed from the study into equity in Auckland's transport system. Equity is an important issue to keep at the forefront of climate action. It is our poorer communities that will be most impacted by climate change. In Hamilton, we know and we see our shift workers walk at night because of the lack of transport options. Knowing these realities is an important part of public transport planning that has transport equity at the center. We'd like to see more detail about who gets access and who doesn't, and a commitment to measuring transport equity. Um, as Eliza Pizzi says, we commend the Council on their aspirations to reduce carbon emissions. Um, however, we do notice some, uh, may perhaps a lack of clarity in the uh, plan with regards to how Council will determine its priorities for public transport investment and or offsetting. And here's an illustrative example that sort of speaks to what you've got in front of you a little bit, um, because it was the best way I could think of trying to explain what we notice. Um, for example, it could be that a new bus service to Morrinsville is required and there's demand for the service, but only a petrol bus is available. The council might resource the bus service if it was the best choice for emissions reduction. However, the council, concerned with its negative emissions goal, may then offset the emissions created by the petrol powered bus. The question is, what would such offsetting make sense if this money could be used to make further public transport investments, for example? It is most likely that the council would analyse the situation and do what had the greatest benefit. However, the decision-making process is not clearly relayed in the plan and the policies do seem to somewhat contradict each other. <laughs> I hope that makes sense to you, um, but I'm happy to talk it through and I know Martin would also be available at a later stage to have more of a conversation on these points. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, for your submission, um, and thanks for coming in as well. Um, so you mentioned the bus example, say to Morrinsville. So um, are you sort of saying that if we can get people on a, on a bus, any bus, even a diesel bus, that we are that would be using less emissions than? No, no. A, I'm just saying that it's not clear or? what what will how the decision making will happen. Um, we we applaud the commitment to negative carbon emissions. However, we can see how that might, um, and and it's my understanding is it's to be carbon negative prior to um, assessing the um, emissions reduction from um, a bus, for example. Um, so the concern is that uh, the choices will be kind of like. Yeah, well, actually, we just want more clarity around how those choices will be made in the in the plan. If it can be just a little bit more uh, described, how the priority, what the what the decision making priorities will be, um, offsetting isn't um, always the best choice. And I guess yeah, if it was made instead of investing into improve public transport, that wouldn't necessarily make a lot of sense to us. However, um, it's more more just being able to see the analysis that the council will undertake um, to make those decisions, um, and yeah, how that will be accessible to us as community. Yeah. Thank you, Anna. And um, we have a question from uh, Councillor Dennis Tigg. Thanks for your submission. <clears throat> In your written submission, you refer to that part of it re relating to uh, network aspiration, regional accessibility. And that um, has a phrase um, that says, subject to availability and demonstrating value for money, the council will seek at least one return trip between regional towns. And your submission uh, suggests that's too vague and conditional and gives no assurance to those smaller towns. And you seek the, the phrase value for money. Well, you say it's open to interpretation and you'd like a firm policy. If you could just expand on your, your thoughts around that and 
you want a, f a firm policy for the one return trip to, per, per day, or do you seek you know, sort of like greater ambition from the council in that in that area? Um, yeah, we would like to see greater ambition, but um, I guess yeah, how how the value for money is determined is perhaps what we would like more uh, clarity around. Yeah. Thank you. Fantastic. All right. Um, yeah, Councillor Rodney. Yeah, thanks for your submission. I'm just I'm a little bit lost with the bus thing. Like, my thinking is. If you have 30 people on a bus from Ronsville to the Hamilton, that would, even if it's a diesel bus or a petrol bus, it'd still be way more better environment than having 30 cars. Yeah, and and that's absolutely true. But my, my understanding is the goal in the plan is to be um, carbon negative before even um, considering a bus, an extra bus, for example. That's what that's what's written in the current strategy, you know, current proposal. Oh, yeah. So. It does. It, it yeah, seems not, yeah. to be at odds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just more clarity, really. Yes. Yeah, just yeah. My understanding. Yeah. Bus is up, so yeah. Absolutely yeah. no, and we totally would support that, but it's this goal to be carbon negative um, before considering the yeah. impact of putting on a bus that concerns us. Thank you. Excellent. Um, I believe that's all the questions we have, but thank cool. you for um, yeah, your written submission and then your verbal submission as well. Yeah, thank you for making the time. Great. Appreciate thank it. Thank you.